Hey there, this is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 101 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, my friends. Welcome back. I am so happy to be here. My favorite time in the entire week when I get to spend a full half hour just chatting with you and sharing the latest and greatest tips and tricks for how to become the teacher you've always dreamed of. It's so much fun for me to be here with you. And today I have such a treat for you. We're going to talk about a topic that is titled, She Was Featured in Forbes, You Never Know How You'll Impact a Life. So, oh my gosh, you're in for such a treat because this just happened. It's a story about one of my former students, and I cannot wait to tell you the story. But before we dive in, I want to do a listener shout out to a very special listener who maybe just like you listens on a different platform other than Apple Podcasts. And so for the past 10 weeks, when I was asking you, please leave reviews, you're probably thinking, Lori, Spotify or whatever platform you're listening on doesn't allow me to leave a review. It's so frustrating, I know. But some of you took it upon yourselves to let me know about the impact that this podcast has had in your teaching life by emailing me directly and writing to me. And honestly, if we took the number of new teachers who have reached out to me privately to thank me for the podcast and added it to the number of reviews we already have, I think we'd reach 100. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Today's listener shout out goes out to Erin Lingenfelter, who wrote to me and who I asked for permission from to share her review. So here's what Erin wrote. She wrote, good morning, Dr. Friesen. My name is Erin Lingenfelter. I'm a junior in college at the University of Louisville. So she's not far from where I live, actually. Um, She said, I'm two years away from graduating with my bachelor's in elementary education. I've been an avid listener to your podcast since the beginning, despite not having a degree yet myself. I've always heard you asking and talking about reviews in your podcast, and I've always wanted to write one. But since I couldn't, due to listening on Spotify, I thought I'd email you. You have been such a great and positive influence on my budding teaching career and sometimes also being a boost of energy to my day when I needed it most. I can't wait for these next few years to pass so I can implement your ideas in my classroom and the ones you've inspired me to create. Alongside this, every time I hear you mention the Ready for School Academy, I want to join as anything education-based excites me, especially things related to fun things with my future students. I've also recommended your podcast to my fellow students and professors, one professor of which plans to include it in his lecture sheets for resources. I hope this email brings a beaming light into your week and that you keep inspiring others for years to come as you've inspired me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do, a future elementary teacher, Erin Lingenfelter. Oh my gosh. Erin, thank you so much for taking the time to reach out and to let me know that this podcast is making an impact on your teaching life. It means the world to me, as you know. And of course, to thank you for being such a loyal listener, I would love to gift you with a $10 Teachers Pay Teachers gift card so you can go ahead and grab some goodies from the TPT store, either for your student teaching or for your new classroom someday. Again, thank you, Erin, so much for your amazing review. All right, now let's dive into today's topic, which I know you're going to absolutely love. Now, in light of recent events in our world, and especially in the United States, I know I've mentioned a few times on this podcast how you just don't know who you have inside your classroom and specifically what kind of an impact you might be having on specific students. Well, I was just recently reminded of this yet once again when a little girl who I taught halfway around the world when she was only six years old in Asia and who I'm still connected to thanks to Facebook 
posted to announce that her business was just featured in Forbes magazine. You guys, Forbes, that's crazy. I'm so proud of her. My little Doris was being featured for her sunglass company, Amavi, which looks so cool, by the way. I'll link to it in the show notes if you want to check it out. Such cool sunglasses. And so, of course, when I saw that, I posted and just wrote, congratulations, Doris, so proud of you. And here's what she wrote back. This is the power of being a teacher, you guys. If you're multitasking, come back to me because this is so cool. She wrote, Lori Friesen, ever since you tutored me when I was six, six, I've completely switched to thinking, writing, and speaking in English first. And it prepared me for moving from Victoria Kindergarten to an international school. You were and still are the most effective warm and sweetest teacher I know. So it means a lot coming from you, dear. And she has a whole bunch of emojis and hearts and stars. And it's so sweet. Like, holy cow, to hear those kinds of words from a student who I taught nearly 25 years ago. Yes, I'm that old. I am your school mom. (laughs) I can help you with insight for years and years of experience. But that means so much because it was nearly 25 years ago. However, it's really going to be even more meaningful to you when I explain what actually was going on when I taught Doris as a new teacher all those years ago. This is going to be very, I think, powerful for you to hear. Now, to give you a little background on Doris, her family was always in the fashion industry. So when I met Doris, Hong Kong was still a British colony, and I was only in my early 20s, probably a lot like a lot of you, and I hadn't even earned my teaching degree yet. So I was just in travel mode. I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. <laughs> so you guys, it's really important for you to know that when I taught Doris, I did not have my teaching degree. I had one year of university under my belt, but I still hadn't committed to being a teacher. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I ended up in Hong Kong because I had met this British guy when I was learning how to dive on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia because I also lived and traveled there and in New Zealand for a year. I had the travel bug. I was living and traveling in lots of different countries, living on rice and love, really no funding from my parents or anyone else, just stopping to work when I needed to. And when I came back to Canada from Australia, finally, after a couple of years of traveling, I was like, okay, I've really got to grow up now. I've got to get my degree. And then this British guy in Hong Kong decides to send me an open-ended return plane ticket to Hong Kong. Well, I couldn't resist that. I mean, still have the travel bug, put off my scholarships for another year for my university, nearly gave my parents a heart attack, I'm sure. But this open-ended ticket meant that I could just stay in Hong Kong as long as I had a visa, of course. And because his tech company was already paying for the flat and for all of our living expenses, I didn't need the money. I just wanted to find a way to fill my time. And because I was thinking of going into teaching, I thought, well, why not get some experience tutoring some kids? So I put up some ads in local grocery stores in Hong Kong. And one of Doris's maids found me that way. It's so crazy how this world works. So because of this kind of crazy set of circumstances, a week later, I found myself sitting in this luxury Hong Kong penthouse in their solarium. The entire room was glass, including the ceiling. And this is craziness, my friends. Like that show Crazy Rich Asians was probably based on Doris's family. So their solarium was filled with tropical trees and flowers. It had a stone pond with koi fish and a rock waterfall, and it all overlooked the sparkling skyline of Hong Kong. And as we sat there every afternoon making conversation in English, Doris's personal maid, Siti, I can still hear Doris's little six-year-old voice saying, Siti, so cute. Uh, Doris's personal maid, Siti, who is from the Philippines and probably the kindest person on the planet, would bring us freshly baked scones and pastries. And I seriously wondered how the heck I ended up there. Well, it turns out that Doris's mom was a very successful fashion wholesale buyer, and she had two very successful clothing stores in downtown Hong Kong. And I apparently was now tutoring her daughter. No pressure at all, right? (laughs) And I can tell you that when the full gravity 
of what I was doing and the job before me hit me, I really didn't know if I was up to the task because every day when I went to Doris's home to to teach her, as I walked up this very steep hill that would get me to the base of their very exclusive luxury apartment, and I'd have to walk by the gate because I was the only person who entered and left that building without my own personal driver. (laughs) Seriously, I felt like I didn't belong there. I felt like a complete fraud. I did my very best to help Doris with her English and I worked to engage her and build a relationship and I tried to be as creative as I could when I was teaching her, but every single day when I left and I made that long walk down the steps again after tutoring her, I wondered if they were just going to tell me not to come back again the next day. I constantly wondered when I was going to be found out for not being a real teacher. If you can see me right now, I'm doing air quotes because real teacher, right? I felt like there was no way I was going to be able to keep this up because I literally had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And here's what stands out for me most in my mind. I remember after feeling this way for a few months and feeling like I just couldn't keep it up any longer because I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. I felt like maybe they should go ahead and pay for somebody who had a real degree because I wasn't even a real teacher. So I asked City if we could arrange for me to meet Doris's teachers at her school so I could ask them, you know, what does Doris need help in and what can I be doing to really help her? So they did. They arranged this meeting for me. And by the way, all of this is done through the maids or nannies because both Doris's mom and dad didn't speak English. Doris's dad was actually very sick. So he was usually in his room and they were very kind, but they couldn't explain to me what Doris really needed. So I was kind of on my own here. So I arrive at this very exclusive private school. And when I get to Doris's classroom, I introduced myself and told the teachers, I just really wanted to ask for some guidance about what they wanted me to be working on with Doris. And you guys, you won't believe what they told me. I still remember they just laughed and said, Lori, whatever you're doing with Doris, keep doing it. We cannot believe the progress she's made with her English since you started tutoring her. She's more confident. She loves English. So whatever you're doing, she takes risks. She's willing to engage. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Please keep doing it. Do more. And I remember thinking, holy cow, really? Because... (laughs) Again, probably like you might be feeling when you're a student teaching or when you're a new teacher, I seriously felt like I had no idea what I was doing. So over the next few days, I really thought about what I had been doing with Doris. And now with the gift of all this time between that experience and now, I realized that it really came down to several things that I now understand I was doing right. And I want to share them with you so that hopefully it can help you to see what you're probably already doing right. And you don't even realize what an impact it's probably making on the children's hearts and minds that you come into contact with every day. And now I believe it's probably why Doris remembers me the way she does today. So first of all, I realized that the first thing I was doing right was that I always had the very best of intentions and I created an environment where she felt safe to take risks. Now that might seem like a small thing. And I think we often overlook this and just assume, well, everybody does this, but that isn't true. Kids feel it if you aren't fully present with them. They feel it if you don't really care, or if you're distracted and you're just trying to get through the day. And also they really feel it when you take the time to create an environment where they can feel safe with you. See, it was my job to teach Doris conversational English, but that wasn't going to happen. She wasn't going to start talking. She was really shy. She was not having, she didn't have a whole lot of confidence when it came to English and she didn't really want to engage me engage with me in English at the beginning because she was so self-conscious. So I had to convince her that I really, really cared about her. I had to let her know that she was safe. So I made a point of coming to our meetings with topics of conversation that would really matter to her. And I really worked on connection points that we had. 
Now, years later, I know that Brian Camborn's conditions of literacy learning theory was in full bloom during our meetings. If you don't know Brian Camborn's theory, it's pretty incredible. He's an Australian literacy researcher. Uh, I'll link to it for you in the show notes for this episode. But I didn't know there was a theory behind what I was doing. I just knew that I needed this little girl to feel safe enough to make mistakes and take risks with me. So I shared and talked about my favorite things to do in my free time. I told her stories about my family and showed her pictures of my puppy Patches because she had a dog that she loved too. And I showed her pictures of my brother because she had a sister. All of these things before I asked her to share about hers. And it was so interesting because at the beginning, she wouldn't share at all. She just nod because she could understand. Those of you who teach English, you know that English is a second language. Speech comes last. So children can often understand and comprehend what they're hearing before they're actually able to speak themselves. So she was very willing to listen and very engaged, but not quite ready to take that risk to speak herself until I continually shared and shared and shared. And this is how children feel safe. This is how you get a window into how they perceive the world. And I remember one time we were looking out the window of her solarium and she pointed to a house and she said, that's my auntie's house. And it was one of the first times she'd really risked sharing something with me. And that house was clearly not nice or as luxurious as Doris's place. It was a very simple little place on the hill. So I asked her, so which house do you like more? And without skipping a beat, she said, my auntie's house. (laughs) I was really surprised. So I asked her why. And she said, because my auntie's house has better ice cream. (laughs) Now she didn't use a complete sentence like that, but she was able to communicate that with me. So I took the time to really build that connection with her so that she felt safe enough to start taking risks with me in English. And when she was afraid to tell me something or didn't know how, we drew pictures to communicate. And then I would teach her the English word for that image or feeling that she was feeling. The point is, I didn't know about any fancy teaching theories. I didn't know we were fully engaged in Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. I didn't know any of that. But what I did know was that I had a little girl's heart and confidence in my hands. And it was my job to build her up with love and care and patience. So when you're kicking yourself about not staying on track with the pacing guide, Remember that these are tiny, fragile hearts and minds you're working with every single day. I know you have a lot of pressure on you, but these kids will remember that you cared about them more than you did the pacing guides when you take the time to slow down and pace with them. In fact, just recently on Instagram, it was so interesting, a new teacher reached out to me and was sharing her frustration and her overwhelm and her exhaustion at trying to keep up with the pacing guides and feeling like she was just flying through it. And none of her students were actually learning anything and they were getting frustrated and engaged. And I had the same advice for her. I said, you know, they probably aren't learning anything because if you feel like you're going way too quickly and you can feel that you've lost them, they're not going to be engaged. And so my advice to her was to slow down and to do less better and to start tracking with them and pacing with them. And guess what happened? She followed back up with me later on and said, actually, yeah, you know, my students became a lot more engaged once I did take a breath and slowed down and focused more on them and where they were than on the content that I needed to be focused on teaching them at a very quick pace. And I think we sometimes forget that because we get so caught up in the pressure and we get so caught up in the pacing guides. But I want to encourage you, especially right now in our world, in this very moment with COVID going on, the most important thing you can do for your students right now is to slow down and to stay tracking with them because especially once the world does go back to normal and kids are back to normal school and our pacing guides do become more of a reality again, until that point... These kids really need you. They need you to be present with them. They need you to not let them feel alone. And when they do go back to school a year later or however, when it, whenever it happens that we're back to normal, a lot of these kids are going to be pretty far behind. So it doesn't really matter if you keep track with the pacing guide right now, because the reality is kids and their families cannot keep up the pace that you would typically do in the classroom. 
So just keep that in mind. It's okay to slow down. It's okay to pace with them because what they need right now is probably more than just academics. All right. The second thing that Doris really taught me was that when you're in the daily slog, it's really hard to see your impact. So this is what I can share with you. It's often not in the moment that you realize your impact. It wasn't like magic every day with Doris. It was hard work. There were days when we were both tired, when one of us or both of us didn't feel like working very hard, but we did it anyway because I was committed to the long game. I was committed to the big goal of helping Doris to become fluent in English. And like I shared earlier, for a long time, I didn't feel like I was making any difference at all. And you might be feeling like that right now, that sometimes you're going so slowly that you feel like you're not making any progress. But then one day, about six months into my work with her, I realized that Doris was now speaking in full sentences in English. It had happened so slowly over the past six months that when we started having real conversations where she could actually ask questions, it was almost easy to overlook. So I want to encourage you that if you're feeling like you're in the daily grind and you're just not making an impact or that your teaching isn't improving or you're wondering if you can keep going and keep doing this, Compare yourself or your students to six months ago, and I promise you, you'll realize exactly how far you've actually come. Now, the third thing that Doris taught me was all about the power of paying attention and finding out what your students really want. So on days when Doris didn't feel like practicing her English, she had a really special little trick that she figured out. And if she's listening to this, I hope she does, because she's going to laugh because she'll know I was on to her. (laughs) But I realized that her favorite trick was to just get me to keep talking so she didn't have to. So she learned this expression. And then So if she asked what I did on the weekend and she liked to ask questions because then I would have to talk, right? So if she asked what I did on the weekend, I would tell her a little bit and then she would say, and then, and of course I would keep on talking, right? But it wasn't too long before I realized what she was doing. So I started to set daily goals for our lessons. And if she met those goals, she would get the biggest reward her little heart desired every Friday. So for this little girl who lived in a privileged world with her own private driver and who wanted for nothing, the one thing in the world she wanted most and that she constantly begged for and that only I could give to her was to learn to sing Disney princess karaoke songs and record her voice in English. Yep, that was it. (laughs) Now, thankfully, I had a lot of experience with singing. I had sung in my high school choir, in my auditioned jazz choir. You know, I was really into singing. I love to sing. And so we were kind of a good match this way. She had her own pink karaoke machine in her giant pink room with her king-size canopy bed. (laughs) And if she did all of her work for the week, she would meet me at the door on Fridays, like literally vibrating. She was so excited. Her eyes were just shining. She would grab my hand and take me directly to her bedroom and we'd sit on the floor of her fluffy pink carpet and practice Disney princess songs in English for half an hour before we'd record her voice singing on her karaoke machine. I so wish I still had those tapes because I saved them for years, but I don't know where they are anymore. It's too bad. I really wish I had them, but I can feel the memory. Like I see it so clearly in my imagination. And it's so funny what you remember too, because when I was working with Doris, I can still see her shining eyes and she'd look up at me and she'd say, Woey. <laughs> I was always woey because L and R are two of the most difficult letter sounds to pronounce in the English language, especially for Asian students. I taught in, um, I actually taught in Japan when I got my teaching degree years later and I realized, oh my gosh, this really is a very challenging thing for students to say. So I was always woey <laughs> because of course my name has both L and R. So for nearly the entire year that I worked with Doris, I was woey and I absolutely love it. <laughs> but I can still see her adorable face and her big wide eyes and she'd ask, Wowie, well, we please, please can we sing Kelby Oki Princess, please, please. <laughs> so cute. 
Seriously, she just captured my heart. And it was because of that experience that I'm always sharing with you on this podcast, the importance of finding out what your students really want to work for, what their chocolate is. Because once you find that one thing for them, you don't realize the power of having celebrations like this to look forward to with your students until you find that one special thing. So especially now, again, with all of the craziness and COVID in our lives, kids need something special and meaningful to look forward to. Now, I know it's not likely going to be Disney princess karaoke songs for your students, but whatever it is, I encourage you to take the time to find out what that one thing is for your students and find a way to weave it into their school experience. Now, I've talked on this podcast before about how I created a treasure map for my classroom so I could share stories with my students about my travels around the world and how hard my class worked for a pirate pajama popcorn party when they reached the hidden pirate treasure at the end of the map. So what will it be for you and for your students? What kind of magic can you weave into their school experience? So I want to remind you in those moments when you feel like you aren't doing enough, like you don't know enough and like you can never give them what they need because most of the time you feel like you have no idea what you're doing. Remember this story because I felt all of those things too, but I just kept going anyways. And apparently it was enough. And I have the value and benefit of perspective over time. I can see things more clearly now because I'm less afraid because I know, because this isn't the first student who's told me this, that when you truly pay attention and when you do the best you can, it is enough. You are enough. You do know enough. Even if you're still a student teacher, even if you don't have your degree, you still are enough. I'm not special. I didn't have any fancy degrees or experience or education when I taught little Doris but I did have a willingness to learn, to keep trying, to stay with her and to give her the very best of me. And you know what? That's always enough. All right. I hope you have a fabulous week. And as always, remember that just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. Bye for now.